Well, maybe not as ubiquitous as the ninja craze of the 80s and 90s or other pop culture oddities of those previous decades, there was a bit of a gargoyles thing going on around the early to mid 90s. In researching the game we'll look at today, this TV show kept creeping up into my memory. It's called Gargoyles, and I have vague memories of watching it on Saturdays as a kid. It was actually produced by Disney and had a somewhat popular reception, spawning comic books, action figures, DVD compilations, and a possible film adaptation, along with a very loyal fan community that lasts even to this day. The show aired its first episode just a week before the North American release of our game for today, Demon's Crest, which is quite an interesting coincidence. Maybe that's why I always have unconsciously linked these two together and even assumed that they were related, even though they only share the gothic grotesque gargoyle likeness. But this association highlights something important about Demon's Crest, and that's its tumultuous release and cryptic gameplay that doomed the game to a life of obscurity. It was so esoteric that to me a distant memory of an old TV show comes to mind before a Capcom developed game with a deep and fascinating lineage. But it's time for us to give the game its due credits and look at the really interesting ideas and mechanics that should have made Demon's Crest stand out. Demon's Crest was developed and published by Capcom, and is the third game to star the character Firebrand, though that isn't even this character's original appearance. Firebrand started his life as the Red Armor in Ghosts and Goblins, that terribly annoying creature that would swing across the screen to strip off your armor. Though, to be fair, it isn't that exact enemy, but a member of his clan. The first two games in the series were released on the Game Boy and NES. There was Gargoyle's Quest, Ghosts and Goblins, released in 1990, exclusively to the Game Boy, and then Gargoyle's Quest 2, The Demon Darkness, released in 1992 to the NES before being ported to the Game Boy exclusively in Japan in 1993. The NES Gargoyles Quest 2 is actually a prequel game, coming before Gargoyles Quest 1 in the timeline. So, Gargoyles Quest 2 is a prequel to Gargoyles Quest 1, which both come before Demon's Crest and are offshoots of Ghosts and Goblins. Did you get all that? Anyway, elements from both of the Gargoyles Quest games would influence the development and gameplay of Demon's Crest. Both of the games have a top-down overworld for the player to navigate, complete with NPCs to talk to and interact with. There are also towns to visit, with more characters that give cryptic hints and speech bubbles. The action of these games, however, takes place in side-scrolling stages that combine platforming, shooting, and dodging. I could maybe make some comparisons with how the games share some gameplay motifs with The Adventure of Link from the Nintendo. Both Gargoyles Quest games actually got good reviews from contemporary reviewers and in retrospectives of more recent years. They were praised for their imaginative take on blending genres and for their technical presentation, even with the simplified graphics of the Game Boy and NES. So that brings us up to the development of Demon's Crest, which was seen as a continuation and modernization of these two games, while also being an opportunity to start a new offshoot series that would, hopefully, last across platforms. Unfortunately, this would never actually materialize, but the original intention was to see how far Capcom could run with the Firebrand character, as Demon's Crest was meant to be a complete re-envisioning for the series for the Super Famicom. The horror themes of the game were a focus of development. In Ghosts and Goblins, the developers remarked on how it was a human versus demon story, so there's a natural sense of good versus evil. 
Yet in Demon's Crest, the same dynamic is not possible since you inhabit the role of an anti-hero, a gargoyle. So they played around with the ideas of evil and amoralism and tried to create an unsettling and frightening atmosphere through the graphics, music, and presentation. Demon's Crest wasn't meant to be a pure action game, though, and the development team pushed themselves to think in new ways as they planned and developed the game. They intentionally tried to confuse and manipulate the player, adding into the horror vibe of the game, and they wanted to convey a sense that there was always something new to see and experience, some secret to find in each stage. And this takes it away from being purely an action game into something that might have more RPG or strategy elements. The producer in charge of Demon's Crest was Tokuro Fujiwara, and he said of Demon's Crest, With Demon's Blaze, the Japanese title for the game, we wanted to preserve the action, but simultaneously increase the strategy elements of the game. We wanted to make a game where as the player progresses, he also needs to be thinking about the order in which he's doing things and the world around him. As new stages and items become available, the player must master new techniques. And in doing so, he will get better at the underlying action component of the game, while also needing to think strategically about the items he's using. And the ending will also change depending on what the player does. The game was meant to be enjoyed by hardcore players who want total completion, or even by more casual players who are just in it for the enjoyment of the story and good gameplay, with difficulty and endings changing depending on how deep you get towards 100%. Replayability was also seen as important with Fujiwara saying, Replayability is the key, something you want to play more and more and won't get bored of, my dream is to make a game you buy one time and then want to play for life. Not so good for the marketing people though, I suppose. You might recognize the name Tokuro Fujiwara as he was involved in the development and production of some of the most recognizable games in Capcom's history, including having a hand in pretty much every Mega Man game through the 16-bit era. Among his many achievements, he is credited as being the creator of Ghosts and Goblins, which he also helped write and design. He then took a leading role in the series, acting as a director or producer for every game that would come in the series up to and including Demon's Crest. Fujiwara is known for his imaginative approach to creating games, but also his strictness and belief that games should offer a challenge, something you definitely see in Demon's Crest. In a translated interview he said of Ghosts and Goblins, Creating the game was exhausting. I conducted location testing in arcades. If the players that tried the game tended not to get stuck at a certain point, I'd have to hurry back to the company and redo that portion. I couldn't let them get by so easily. There are tricks you can use to avoid dying, right? Once I figured out what they were, I'd quickly thwart players who attempted to use them. You'll have to forgive me. So even though this quote was for Ghosts and Goblins, the type of challenge it describes definitely comes across in Demon's Crest, as it can get pretty tough and even rather cryptic and easy to get lost in some of the stages or mapping areas. Even still, Fujiwara brought his trademark innovation and imagination to Demon's Crest, which he claims was a necessity in the cutthroat world of 2D game development when developers could steal ideas and release games in a matter of months. Another important person in the development of Demon's Crest was Kenichi Iwayo. Demon's Crest would be the first game Iwayo would work on, and it set him in motion to help develop two icons of survival horror, Parasite Eve and Resident Evil. In fact, some even say Iwayo was the man who saved Resident Evil, as he was responsible for some of the major story elements that have become synonymous with the series, including the Umbrella Corporation, T-Virus, the use of zombies, and the creation of stars. If you're interested in learning more about early Resident Evil, I would recommend reading up more about him as it is a really fascinating story of how he was able to steer Resident Evil in bold new directions when the production 
was starting to fall apart. I bring up these two, though, to show the depth of talent that went into creating Demon's Crest. It had a mix of new ideas and ingenuity from Iwayo, along with the established gaming credentials and vision of Fujiwara. But even with this talent behind the game, it was not a commercial success, to put it rather conservatively. There's a story floating around that has become known with the game that it actually sold negative copies in a week because it was returned more often than it was purchased. I find this a little hard to believe, but in researching the game, I found mention of it multiple times. And while the shock of the claim is enough to keep it circulating, sure enough, I found the source of the rumor here in Nintendo Power, issue 100. More likely though, the slower sales could have been a result of Capcom themselves, with Nintendo Power saying that the game would be hard to find at its release because of a limited production run. Either way, I think Iwayo himself sums up the impact Demon's Crest had when in an interview for a Resident Evil game he was asked about Demon's Crest and responded with, Oh, you know Demon's Crest? I'm surprised. Not many people do. Demon's Crest has a surprisingly deep and fleshed out story, which adds to the RPG stylings of the presentation and gameplay. Upon starting a game, you get a story background through an opening cinematic that is actually quite artistic and well done with creepy organ music playing over a story slideshow and Mode 7 illustrations. The cinematic sets the stage for the action of the game and gives the background for the world and the characters. In the world of Demon's Crest, there is a realm of demons and a realm of humans. In the demon realm, there are six magical stone crests that represent elements such as fire, earth, and time. When the crests are combined, they form Captain Planet, or sorry, the Crest of Infinity, which grants its bearer unlimited power and the ability to conquer all the realms. Firebrand was able to get five out of the six crests and challenges a dragon for the final crest, the Crest of Heaven. He wins, but in doing so is badly wounded allowing a rival demon named Phalanx the opportunity to swoop in and steal all the crests for himself. So now Firebrand must fight through six stages to challenge Phalanx, who is top dog, or gargoyle as it were, in the demon realm. Throughout the game, Firebrand regains the crests, which give him new abilities and open up new gameplay possibilities. The game itself then is an interesting mashup of genres that modernizes and expands on the form of the earlier games in the series. I've seen it referred to as an action game with RPG elements, and I see it as drawing main inspiration from Ghouls and Ghosts and Mega Man X, which makes sense given the ancestry. But even still, there are some hints of what would become the Metroidvania genre, as you're expected to return to previous parts of the game to explore and find new secrets as you gain new abilities. The game itself starts off with a bang, and within the first minute of the game you are faced with taking out a boss, a huge skeletal dragon which gives some framing for the story of the game. The skeleton is actually the reanimated remains of the demon dragon who Firebrand defeated to gain the crests in the prologue. The quick start forces you to work out the controls in a rush, but it really isn't too difficult if you're used to 2D action games. The opening level is pretty straightforward, but offers a good opportunity to further test out the controls and learn a few of Firebrand's abilities, including the flying or hovering ability that he has right from the start of the game. It has a bit of a learning curve, but is tuned well enough as to not be a game-breaking ability that allows you to simply fly across the level, at least until you get the air gargoyle form, more on which a little later. At the end of the first stage, you have the first proper boss, and he can be a bit of a challenge in the first attempt, which is a foreboding hint of things to come. 
After the opening level, you gain access to a world map and can fly around the Mode 7 world to choose stages to complete. While the aesthetic of the map screen is really cool, it isn't the most user-friendly part of the game. And there's not really a whole lot of clarity on where to go in terms of stages. Or at least I didn't think so until I found out that by pressing start, you can bring up a mini-map to help with direction. I actually wonder though if this is one of the reasons for the high amount of returns and the apocryphal story of the game's release as the ambiguity and somewhat ugly Mode 7 map screen could be a reason to rage quit the game and pop Super Mario World back into your Super Nintendo. Interestingly though, you can access the final boss within the first few minutes of the game, right after finishing the first stage. And if you do this, Phalanx is actually easier. It's a pretty audacious design choice but I actually wouldn't even recommend it, because if you beat him in this early stage, you'll miss out on the more fulfilling story endings. Not to mention you bypass all the exploration and enjoyment of actually playing through the game. This sets up an odd gameplay scenario though, where the more you play, the harder the game becomes. Play and unlock more, and you're rewarded with the toughest version of the final boss. This really flies in the face of what might be normal in game design as you're often rewarded with less challenge as you progress through a game, but not so here. A retrospective review of the game I was reading put it better than I could, saying, Demon's Crest proves that accepting the challenge, not just reaching the end of the game, is the game's true reward, that climbing the mountain is better than climbing the hill. One thing that is worth the challenge though, should you catch the bug to do so, is that by getting 100% completion and defeating the hardest form of the final boss, you get a secret password that unlocks the ultimate gargoyle form which has all the powers of the other forms built in, and a stronger attack that lets you challenge the true final boss of the game, the Dark Demon. As you move into the second stage, the natural barriers start to become more obvious, and there are stone statues, sheer walls, water pits, impossible enemies. The hits just keep on coming, and they keep your early progress rather narrow. Stages are generally pretty short and linear until you get the powers to find secrets and branching paths, which is when the stages open up a little bit more, even though they always do still stay on the shorter side. The stages have some variation, too, and remind me of games like Castlevania or Super Metroid, of course. One of my favorites have these colorful stained glass windows in the background that, obviously, enemies break through for the attack. At the beginning of the second stage, you get access to a small town center with a few shops to explore. There's a potion shop, called the Black Lotus, operated by a crazed-looking ape man named Forappa. As you gather bottles throughout the stages, you can return to the Black Lotus and fill them with various potions that do things like teleport you out of the stage, restore health, or resurrect Firebrand if he dies. There's a spell shop too, the Wise Man's Shop, operated by Morak. To use spells, you have to gather vellum pieces in the stages and have them inscribed by your boy Morak. The gaming shop allows you to play a simple whack-a-mole style minigame for money and extra lives, and the last shop is the Talisman Shop, run by Malwus. Actually though, Malwus doesn't sell a damn thing, and his only purpose is to describe the function of the talismans you find throughout the game world. Equip a talisman and talk to Malwus and he will give you a vague and mysterious explanation about its function. There are four gargoyle forms to unlock through the playthrough, along with added powers to the default form. The Fire Gargoyle, which is the only form available at the beginning of the game. The Fire Gargoyle can hover, stick to walls, and shoot a basic fireball attack. As you progress, you learn new powers to break stone blocks, climb walls, and shoot tornadoes, which I never once used in my playthrough. Equipping the Crest of Earth, 
the first you find in the game turns you into the Ground Gargoyle. As his name suggests, the Ground Gargoyle cannot fly, but he vomits his attack onto the ground and is extremely effective for taking out ground-based enemies. He also has a shoulder charge that can be used to break open new paths in the stages. The next two are even more specialized, with the Crest of Air bringing on the Aerial Gargoyle, who has expanded flying abilities and can go upwards instead of just hovering around. And then the Crest of Water, which allows you to assume the tidal gargoyle form and navigate some of the underwater sections of the game, though he's absolutely useless above the water. The last of the unlockables is the Legendary Gargoyle, which is claimed after beating a boss for the third time. The Legendary Gargoyle is an enhanced version of the Fire Gargoyle who takes less damage and has a more powerful attack. To try to explain the huge impact the Legendary Gargoyle can actually make, in my own playthrough I was stuck at one boss and couldn't beat him no matter how many times I tried and how many potions I ended up using. However, one time with the Legendary Gargoyle was enough for me to beat the boss with minimal effort. There is that other form too that I spoke of earlier and is only possible after beating the game with 100% completion and then starting over on another playthrough. As you start to unlock the gargoyle forms and work through the game, one of the biggest criticisms starts to show itself. The menu system, and the amount of time that is spent jumping in and out of the menu will slowly begin to drive you towards madness. The burdensome nature of the menu design becomes glaringly obvious throughout the game, but is also particularly apparent in those in which you're required to light torches, break through obstacles, or even just transition from the water to flying. The final boss in the game is Phalanx, and he has three different phases, depending on how much of the game you completed. In my most recent playthrough to get the gameplay for this video, I did not achieve 100% completion. Sorry guys. So I only fought through two phases. I didn't get the best ending as a result, but I haven't felt the desire to go back and try to get the last remaining vellum and power up. Too many other games to play, I suppose. Demon's Crest is a bit more forgiving than its other Capcom cousins, but that doesn't mean it's low on difficulty. There are infinite lives and a health bar, one that you can upgrade to make larger, but the enemies in the stages can be pretty difficult, much like the baddies in Ghosts and Goblins. But the larger health bar means you can sometimes just brute force your way through. Firebrand does have a large hitbox though, and things like spike obstacles seem to cause damage even when just brushing a pixel against them. The main challenge in the game though is the maddening boss battles. A few of the bosses in particular are just plain brutal, and I don't see how it's possible to beat them without taking hits. I'd say it's maybe an 80-20 for the bosses that I would consider hard, versus easier bosses that are really hammy and can be taken out on the first try. Or maybe I just suck at video games, that's possible too. To this point we've really been focusing on the technical aspects of the game and how some of the stages play out but I don't think that tells the whole story of Demon's Quest. I often think about how an aspect of greatness in a game is the feel of the game itself, the way it actually feels to play the game. It's something about the control and the sense of command or in how the parts of the game unify to form a whole. It could also be in the aesthetics of the game too and how the artistic direction of the game makes me feel when I play it. 
Games that fall into this category may be the subject of opinion, but I think all of the elements of Demon's Crest come together to hit these points for me. It has really excellent and interesting gameplay, bordering on cryptic at times, but still really fun. It also has excellent art direction, everything from the backgrounds to the enemy sprites to the music and how the bosses act. That artistic direction goes a long way in Demon's Crest and really drives home the fact that you're playing something with a lot of vision and talents behind it. Even with the poor sales numbers that we talked about a little bit earlier, Demon's Crest received pretty good reviews upon its release. GamePro praised the game, saying Demon's Crest brings depth and artistry to the action-adventure genre, making it one of the season's top Super Nintendo games. EGM praised the graphics and gameplay and scored it an 8.25 out of 10. Nintendo Power scored the game with average scores, the highest marks going to graphics. But in the 100th issue of Nintendo Power, fans actually rated Demon's Crest number 90 on their list, much to the chagrin of Nintendo Power. Likely as a result of the poor sales, Demon's Crest is the last entry in the series, and while Ghosts and Goblins itself would get some spiritual successors in the Maximo games on PlayStation 2, the Demon's Crest series never again saw the light of day. Firebrand was resurrected as a playable character in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, though. And Demon's Crest has actually gotten a bit more love over the last few years which is why I hesitate to call it a forgotten gem or anything like that at this point. It was first ported to the Wii Virtual Console in 2014, and then to the 3DS Virtual Console in 2017. As of 2020, it's also available on the Switch Online subscription service, leading many to finally be able to discover and enjoy this game. which I obviously would really recommend. Demon's Crest can be an unforgiving and cryptic game at times, but even if you decide to maybe play with a walkthrough, it's a heck of a fun ride to lead Firebrand and take out the demon hordes. <laughs>